Welcome back, friends. I am Frank Fagnone, President and CEO of Old Salem Museums and Gardens and the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts. This is our second episode in our series about color and preservation. Our color for today is blue. Daniel, you know, I know a little bit about the history of blue. It's kind of complicated, but I'm particularly interested in how blue starts to become a part of the Southern colonies, certainly a part of our collections at Mesda. Tell me a little bit about this room because this blue is pretty spectacular. Yeah, so this room is from a house called Cherry Grove and it was built on the Eastern shore of Virginia about 1760. And it came to the museum in the 1960s and was installed here in the 1980s. The thing about the paint on these walls is that we're looking at, by and large, 18th century paint that's just been allowed to weather over time. This paint would have been made originally using linseed oil, Prussian blue, and um, lead white. And over time, that combination will sort of go back into this flat matte finish, even though originally it would have probably been a lot brighter, a lot shinier. The idea of a historic blue is really a concept. Blue as a concept in the colonies could range a full spectrum of colors of blue. Well, exactly. So depending on the exact proportion of blue pigment, uh, other pigments, the type of oil you use to mix it, um, how that oil has been processed, all of that can have an impact on what your final blue looks like. So for a really rich, deep blue like this, you're gonna use a lot more, in this case, Prussian blue pigment. So would using this amount of blue in a house, and in this case, is this a dining room, I'm sorry? This dining room or a parlor. Parlor, um, would really be a sign of wealth. It's a sign of wealth, it's also a sign of your connections with trade. The fact that you have the opportunity to be able to buy this stuff, I think it also sort of tells you something about your connections with the worlds of science. So in the early part of the 18th century, a Prussian scientist, a German scientist, um, discovers a way to synthesize a blue pigment that is relatively easy to make and um, is relatively stable. And it's called Prussian blue. And suddenly this pigment, this color, that historically came from exotic minerals like azurite um, and lapis can suddenly be made in a laboratory. Because Prussian blue can be made um, artificially and in large quantities, what begins as sort of a, a very wealthy signifying color, as the 18th century moves on, you start to see it in much more middling circumstances because it's now available. Now let's jump into the other stuff, this beautiful stuff we have sitting in front of us. In China, there is beginning really in about the 15th century, this trade in exotic ceramics. The Chinese have developed a way to make incredibly light, thin, translucent pottery. The blue and white color combination really becomes the iconic color combination in the eyes of wealthy Europeans who are collecting this stuff. You know, of course, bringing um, Chinese ceramics to Europe is incredibly expensive. And so European potters are trying to create imitations of them. And while they have a really hard time up until the middle of the 18th century with getting close to creating porcelain, mm -hmm. they have more success marginally more success by just copying the decoration. So for example, this tea service here was made in England. It is a kind of highly refined stoneware that has been painted with cobalt in a decorative pattern that really resembles some of these Chinese exports. But at the same time, there's also still a huge trade in Chinese export porcelain like this jar, which is part of a, a garniture, which would have actually gone across a fireplace. This is a plate we have on loan from the Reeves Collection at Washington and Lee University. Mm -hmm. This is part of a service commissioned for George Washington. It's actually meant to symbolize his membership in the Society of the Cincinnati. And you see this blue and white decoration yeah. around the edge, the hand-painted decoration in the middle, and if you were to pick this up, it's immediately apparent. This is not some kind of refined stoneware. This is the real deal. The main pigment to create blue in pottery is cobalt. 
and all of these really include cobalt blue in their decoration. Down here, we have a piece of Shenandoah Valley pottery where we have salt clay stoneware with cobalt brushed decoration on top of it. It seems very utilitarian compared to these. That's the other thing. So stoneware is really cool because it, because of the type of clay and this glazing process, which involves um, vaporizing salt, it becomes impervious to water and won't react to acids. The idea that blue has this transformation from the medieval times of kings to, you know, this pot in, in Virginia, right? Um, then we get to textiles, and I, I think, you know, by the time we're looking at textiles in the colonies, we're looking at indigo production, and that really changes things, doesn't it? It does. You know, when we're thinking about textiles and colors and dyes, that's a whole other set of pigments and plants that you might use. Historically, a plant called woad is used to create blue, but starting in the late 17th century, indigo begins to be cultivated for blue. and Indigo blue is this really vibrant, very stable blue color, but it's incredibly labor intensive to create. Um, and so really the production of indigo in the Americas is completely reliant on enslaved labor. And so this is the shift really that happens in the colonies, right? It's when indigo gets introduced and the only way that that really can be produced is because of enslaved labor. Exactly. I mean, that's what makes indigo profitable for, say, South Carolina during the 18th century. And blue directly related to the production of indigo and then the kind of facilitation of that as pigment really drives an economy of the southern colonies, correct? Absolutely. So when you think about what the cash crops are in South Carolina and Georgia during the 18th century, it's rice, it's indigo, and it's not until the late part of the 18th century and early 19th century that cotton really emerges. Indigo is still um, used today. I mean, you think about the blue jeans you're wearing, I mean, traditionally those blue jeans are dyed with indigo and there's still artisanal producers who, who actually do indigo dyeing for denim. The path from high culture to my blue jeans is pretty amazing. Yeah, and then in the 19th century, as chemistry advances, more and more options for creating blues and other colors emerge, some of which are ultimately more stable. Some, after 20, 30, 50, 100 years, we actually have discovered are less. They actually continue yeah. to react. I mean, I don't know, but this feels like a wallpaper fragment. Yeah, so this is a little tiny book published by the Henkel Press in Newmarket, Virginia, and it's been bound with what appears to me to be a fragment of wallpaper. And here you see that sort of vibrant blue. Yeah, many different shades of this blue. Exactly. So you can imagine that um, the binder probably had a, a couple fragments of wallpaper left over mm -hmm. and they needed a, a good binding and so they went ahead and used that wallpaper. You know, today we think of the 18th and even 19th centuries as being sort of painted periods. Mm -hmm. In reality, we now know wallpaper was far more common. And so this little book makes me start to think about fabric for clothing, ribbons for women to tie on their hats or their bonnets, shoelaces, you know, that blue starts to become much more common in how we present ourselves as, as an individual. I think so, and I think we should also keep in mind that there's something deeply psychological about all this too. I mean, blue makes you feel a certain way, and that's cultural, of course, but blues tend to be calming, appealing. And so I think there's also an aspect of psychology to all of this. So thank you again for joining us for this episode of Colors in Preservation. Stick around. I'm Frank Fagnone. I'm Daniel Ackerman. See you next time. <laughs>